Thank you, Yasser. That goes way back, <laughs> that introduction. Um, so let me go ahead and get my screen share in order. And thanks everybody for attending and thanks so much for the, um, the invitation today. And I love the, um, the icon, that's great. Let me just get things ready. All right, whoops, that's not my first slide. Hmm. Do you want to just click go. the arrow just, to get to the, yeah. Yep, I got it. <laughs> just, just took me a second. All right, so let me just check the time. Um, hold on, just one more second. All right. Well, again, thanks everybody for inviting me today. And I'm gonna focus on severe maternal morbidity and especially thinking about causal pathways from an equity as well as a population level perspective. And really this is gonna be sort of a more conceptual talk rather than focusing on actual results. <clears throat> so I'm um, gonna talk about severe maternal morbidity and why we should study it and what it is, this sort of background material. And then most of my time is gonna be talk um, talking about how we're studying it. So, and I know that um, um, many of you already know this introductory stuff, but I know there's a broad, um, broad sort of expertise and background in the audience. So I just um, wanted to stop to um, start with this sort of general introductory material to get us all on the same page. So in the US, more women die from pregnancy and childbirth related causes than any other high income country. And that can be seen on the slide at the um, here, at, at the figure. And unfortunately, maternal deaths are not declining. And in this figure here, it may be a little bit overestimated as we've seen in more recent years as maternal um, mortality data have um, been sort of revamped a bit, but still it is higher than other high income countries and it's not on the decline. In addition, many deaths are considered preventable or avoidable through better care. And we have um, problems with disparities. We have unfortunately black, um, um, and indigenous, um, indigenous American people in particular have two to four times higher maternal mortality than the rest of the population. And this has led people to try to get more attention paid to maternal health, in particular, um, putting the M back in maternal fetal medicine has been one common phrase, and this article goes back to 2013. And in the ensuing years, and especially the last um, handful of years, which is when I really started focusing my work on the mom and maternal health, um, there has been a lot more media coverage and some of the articles and series of articles um, and pieces are highlighted here. And there's been a lot more advocacy and um, people putting forth legislation as well. And then to that point, um, I don't know how many of you knew about um, the, um, the White House Maternal Health Day of Action, which was just two of um, two days ago. It's the first time they've done that. There, I assume they'll have recordings available. There was a, an amazing panel of people speaking. And then following that are other pages on the web um, talking about um, legislation and other, just um, how this has sort of um, instigated more attention to maternal health in many ways, but just wanted to highlight the Build Back Better bill in particular, which has passed the House and I'm still waiting on the Senate, but variety of activities related to improving maternal health. And it represents $3 billion in funding. So why should we focus, why do I focus on SMM in particular? Well, if you think of maternal health on a continuum of severity, maternal death is obviously at the top. And then severe maternal morbidity is basically the next rung on the pyramid. Also, it's 50 to 100 times more common than maternal death, affecting about one to 2% of birthing people. And so it's much more feasible. And not surprisingly, it has a lot of sim similarities, um, sort of descriptively to maternal death or demographically. Um, it has increased, um, it's doubled in the last two decades. It um, has the same types of um, stark racial ethnic disparities, high preventability, 
and shared common causes, including hemorrhage and hypertensive disorders being some of the most common. So that gives you a little bit of background about why we should study it. And now just a little bit more about definitions and, and how we sort of find cases. Um, this is really the most, I'd say, popular definition here in the US is listed here. So it's unintended outcomes of the process of labor and delivery that result in significant short or long-term consequences to a woman's health. And really it's, um, it's really an acute um, onset during this time. There are many ways to operationalize or ascertain it. Chart review is the gold standard, but that is not feasible for the sort of population-based large scale, scale kind of work that, that I tend to focus on. And so what we've been doing is using the CDC index, which was designed for using large scale administrative or claims data. Um, and it has been validated in particular. Um, I saw that Elliot Main is on the call. He has led the most, um, I'd say, rigorous and largest validation study of that index. But this sort of, um, so that's, that's worked well for us. But I just wanted to also acknowledge that it, it because of this variety, no consensus definition or ascertainment method, um, it's somewhat difficult to compare across studies and um, populations, much less countries. And then um, for those of you not familiar with the CDC index, this just lists the indicators that are part of it. So there's a whole slew of ICD codes, diagnostic and procedure codes that are used to find cases. And then I highlighted blood transfusion because about half of the cases are uh, oops, blood transfusion only. This is partly because it's important to include transfusion, um, for example, to capture hemorrhage, which is not captured well in other codes, but we don't know volume. So it sort of overestimates because we don't know if it was a small transfusion or a more substantial um, clinically important transfusion. Um, and so what we have tended to do and what I think is becoming more the, um, just the norm is to you look, at, you look at the index overall as well as look at it without including transfusion as an indicator. So you're leaving out those um, transfusion only cases. So that was the background. And now I'll talk about how we're studying it. So the first thing we need is data. And California is a really good place for doing this work. We have a lot of births per year, a very diverse population in many ways and we have supported, supportive um, sort of organizations within the health department to access data, um, right? Um, the new name for, it was OSHPID, now it's HCI. That's um, who we go through to get data. And then this um, slide shows you sort of the three elements that are critical for doing this work on, um, on population-based SMM work and especially when it comes to equity. So we start with in the middle is sort of our hub using being um, vital records. And that basically gives you information on all births and fetal deaths. So we know what our entire population is. And that is a really good source for sociodemographics, high quality data on race, ethnicity, education, parity, things that often are not present or not present in very good quality in hospital discharge or claims data. And so that's, that's sort of our hub. And then we link, um, we have access to, we're able to link to hospital discharge data, and that's how we find the SMM cases using the CDC index and all the codes that are in there. And then the third piece is to really focus on equity, which um, that's really what I'm focusing on in this talk because it's um, because of the disparities that exist. And um, I think to make progress for everyone, we really need to focus on figuring out how to eliminate those. Um, but basically we need some marker of where someone lived to really adequately look at social determinants. And fortunately, we're able to get addresses that are, that are included on um, vital records. Um, it's a residential address at the time of birth. And what we do is we geocode those addresses. We assign, that means assign a latitude and a longitude. And then from that, we can extrapolate to, um, for example, census tract, which we um, interchangeably refer to as neighborhood. And from that, we can get lots of information from the census, for example, on socioeconomics. We can link to other data sets to think about built environment um, and environmental the connections to environmental contamination um, databases, and just basically opens up that whole window of being able to look at that sort of thing. And then, um, so we've got data, fortunately, and then just wanted to talk about um, 
how we got started on this work, um, you know, a, your team is absolutely critical. And I think any of us would say that our work is multidisciplinary and really relies on a multidisciplinary team effort. Um, so this started really with um, working with Barbara Abrams, who was actually my PhD advisor quite a while back. And we were both really interested in doing something on maternal health. So we started, you know, talking about it. And at that time, Stephanie Leonard, who many of you know, um, was a PhD in Barbara's, um, on Barbara's team, PhD um, candidate. And then Stephanie actually came to work on my team as a postdoc. And then you, you know what she's doing now um, as an instructor. And so basically we were thinking, how do we study maternal health and what is this severe maternal morbidity? We weren't familiar with that. Really the, the CDC index was really coming into um, um, being more well known. And that led us to meeting with Elliot, who I really didn't know until this time. This was about five years ago. And he had done the validation um, of the index, of course. And we, were, we said, do you think this is okay to use for, for epidemiologic research? And he gave the green light. So that gave the go ahead. And then we also got um, Nahasan Mujahid, who's shown here, to partner with us. She's a social epidemiologist at Berkeley. And she was absolutely critical for her expertise in thinking about disparities and, um, and social determinants. So that was our starting point. And um, fortunately we have grown over time. I think they're just, you know, even um, just the interest in this area is just growing very quickly, but just wanted to say, I can't name everyone here, but the names are here, the pictures are here. And just wanted to say that it represents a very multidisciplinary group from clinicians, MFMs, nurse scientists, neonatologists, health services people, um, you know, perinatal, social epidemiologists, methodologists, biostatisticians, and then the, the trainees in turn bring all those, um, that variety of expertise as well. And then another thread of how um, I really got started in this work was working with other familiar faces, um, um, Dr. Gibbs Gerson and Butwick. And we were, we've, we were primarily doing, starting with some analyses thinking about postpartum readmission and severe maternal morbidity. Um, and then that led us to start the severe maternal morbidity working group in 2017. And about a year into it, we, um, we let go of the term severe and broadened it more generally to um, maternal. We got rid of the term severe and then it was just maternal morbidity working group. I just wanted to call that out to kind of show how this work has emerged, especially here at Stanford. Um, this group meets once a month and we really try to keep it informal and, and really wanted to be a forum for discussing works in progress. So just wanted people to be aware of that. If you'd like to be on the sort of the list, the email list, please let me know. And better yet, if you'd like to present, please let me know. It really is a great um, opportunity for discussing work with a multidisciplinary group. Um, so please keep that in mind. So when we think about social determinants and equity in particular, um, it, it is very complex. And so where do we start? Well, and just talking to you today, I wanna to start with some basic um, definitions, which many of you have heard, I'm sure. This is outlined well in particular in a paper by Dr. Joya Crear Perry, um, head of the National Birth Equity um, Collaborative and I think many of us have heard this definition of social determinants, it's most common, you know, it's where you, facets of where you live, learn, work, play, and worship that affect health. But I really wanted to emphasize what Dr. Crear Perry said and um, taking it a step upstream from there, really important when you're thinking about social determinants to think about structural determinants, which she points out include cultural norms, policies, institutions, and practices that define the distribution or maldistribution of social determinants. And then in turn, thinking about health equity um, and not just framing it as disparities, really um, I think is a, an effort towards um, acknowledging um, these determinants in this way as we move forward. And then this um, slide really shows you sort of the, 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 the breadth of what has been published regarding um, actual you know, research articles related to social determinants and severe maternal morbidity. And we had seen this ourselves in the literature when we were getting started, but it, fortunately last year, someone actually did the hard work to do a systematic review 
Um, this was um, Elizabeth Howell's group. Many of you are familiar with her work. I'm sure she's a leader in this area. Um, but you know, it's not to look at every single um, line here, but just that there aren't very many lines and that they're highly variable in sort of the granularity at which they um, consider are able to consider um, social determinants. So very few at the level of what we would consider like the neighborhood. And even a few of these at the bottom um, weren't even you know, out yet when the review was done. So I'd say that primarily the SMM research had been focusing and still is on health conditions and health care or more downstream um, sort of drivers of SMM. And that is absolutely critical. Um, we, we have to do that work to understand it. But in just the point I wanna make is it doesn't capture the whole breadth of sort of the complexity of causes and especially those upstream factors. And it doesn't necessarily, hasn't centered equity, although I feel that changing for sure. Um, that is what are the root causes of disparities? And to borrow an analogy from Kamara Phyllis Jones, who is amazing, especially with analogies, um, we've been focusing really at the edge of the cliff. And really we need to think about how do we look upstream and keep people from getting to the edge of the cliff as well as how to keep them from falling off of it. So now I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about how sort of our conceptual framework in this work um, has developed. And this slide is a simplistic version of the first um, R01 that we got. And that started um, uh, about three and a half years ago, almost four years ago. And basically there we started with thinking, a lot of that work focuses on weight, which I won't go into and how that um, is related to severe maternal morbidity, like pre-pregnancy BMI, um, gestational weight gain, interpregnancy weight change. And then for social determinants, we were really focused on as a start, it seemed like a reasonable starting point, because of um, how little had been done, really focusing on census tract or neighborhood level so markers of socioeconomic disadvantage. And then also thinking about how weight could mediate those. And then as we got working, we realized um, there's some things we were ready to add in and think about, um, you know, how does how do comorbidities, for example, um, sort of mediate weight's relationship with SMM, <clears throat> as well as thinking, upstream from the social determinants, thinking about structural determinants, as I've noted, and then also how do we bring in quality of care? And this is our sort of third generation. This is our most current, um, how we're thinking about it. This is actually in an article that's in press and women's health issues. So if you'd like to see the sort of the, the pros that goes with this, um, hopefully that'll be out soon, but really basically trying to visually project um, the multi-dimensionality, multi-sectoral nature of, of, of how we think about SMM and especially equity. And we talk about how this really needs to be grounded in principles of reproductive health as multi-level, life course, um, and the importance of community engaged research as well. So we've, we've done a lot of work that describes SMM and especially when it comes to disparities in California. And I just wanna um, highlight one, one piece here that Stephanie Leonard led. Um, she did a couple of papers on looking at trends and, um, and has taken multiple looks at disparities as well. But this just gives you at least a visual on how SMM has been increasing in California in, um, in recent years. And it shows you the disparities and it shows you that disparities have persisted. And also um, um, Stephanie looked at the ability of maternal individual level factors like obesity, advanced age, comorbidities and cesarean birth to explain disparities, which they do partially, um, but not completely. And they also um, importantly have not explained the trends. I would love to, um, I think that, that often, you know, we found that in the literature people would focus on these individual level factors and just without really having done analyses expected that that was contributing to the trends. It didn't show up that way in California, but it would be really great to be able to replicate that in another, another state. And then this slide is a listing of what we have in progress with regard to social structural determinants and SMM. And this is really led by Mahasa Mujahid's team at Berkeley. And I've shown pictures of the lead authors um, who were all trainees, at least at the time of this work. 
Um, but it shows you the variability and the types of sort of um, quote exposures that we're looking at. Um, and many of these are, um, some are under review, some are almost under review, but really I don't have time to go into results. Um, we tend to see results in the expected direction. Um, but anyway, I the, these are works in progress and um, the first authors I think will, will be um, at the ready to give more information on these in the near future. So that's kind of like what we've been doing up to now. And what I really want to spend the rest of the time on is talking about um, a new grant that we got. So we got an, an R01, a second one from NINR. They're both from NINR. And I just want to talk to you about what we're doing for that. And I do believe that will be new information for, um, for more of you than maybe the first part was. But basically, um, we are expanding that work to include other states. So getting beyond just California, it is interesting, but it is not the same as other states. Um, to, to wherever we can get some of those, those elements of those three circles that I showed you of linked data. And then we're also expanding um, the way we think about social determinants. So we started out with just social disadvantage, but we expanded to other domains. And then the next few sl slides, I'll give you a few more details. And then, you know, we're expanding our conceptual framework. So you've seen how that evolved. And so that plays out within this grant as well. And thinking more about these pathways that span like the upstream to the acute events. And then importantly, we are collaborating. So with PQCs in California, CMQCC and Louisiana and Illinois. And um, so that will be very interesting work. And what we're going to do is look at um, various quality improvement initiatives in those states and what their impact on disparities in SMM has been. And then we'll connect that knowledge with what we are learning about these pathways within the state. And, um, and I have another slide, I'll give you more detail about that in a sec. And then another piece that I think is really important is that we have um, and it formed an advisory board. It's not like a community advisory board, it's broader, um, that includes people, um, patient and community-based advocates from the states where we'll be doing the work so that we can understand the context there and really, um, and, and disseminate the work as well, as well as form it. And then I wanted to acknowledge um, collaborators who weren't on the, the earlier team slide who are new to this particular grant. And we just found out about it a couple of months ago. So Maya Mather, a um, biostatistician in PEDS and QSU, and Karen Phibbs um, in um, neonatology. And he and Scott Lorch at University of Pennsylvania are really doing the hard work to um, obtain the state-based data because it really is a, it is not a, um, it is not a small task. Um, and then Veronica Gillespie is the head of the Louisiana PQC and Ann Borders and Patty Lee King with the Illinois PQC. And then this is just a picture reflecting um, a visual of the prior slides um, showing you that how we're going from social determinants and then health related intermediaries at multiple levels and then how that um, manifests as SMM and inequities in SMM. And then just a little bit more detail about the pieces here. So the study population, um, the table shows you some details, but basically we're going to at least get data from 2015 and eight to 18. And that would represent over 4 million births. And the births in these states represent one in three US births, which I think is kind of cool. But you can see here the variability by state, um, very varied um, births per year. Um, varied um, levels of maternal death, um, race ethnicity breakdown, um, and differences in outcomes and policies and so forth. And then, and then a little bit more detail about the social determinants that we're going to be looking at, just showing you a list basically here of the different domains and some things, um, some measures that we'll be looking at within each one. Um, so socioeconomic disadvantage, structural inequity, community resources is really, you can think of it as built environment as well. And also finding out what measures we can um, have related to healthcare access.
And then here's just showing you a little bit more specifically the health related intermediaries that we're going to look at, um, variety of morbidities, um, thing, um, aspects of mode of birth that we can get between the, the hospital discharge and the vital record, and then um, various metrics of um, the quality of care at the hospitals where people give birth. So that gives you just a feel of how we're gonna fill in um, those pieces of the pathways that I've been talking about. And then I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about um, how we're kind of framing the analyses. So AIMS one and two are really um, thinking about all the state data compiled. And first, you know, just breaking these pathways down. First, really thinking about social determinants, how they're related to SMM, and then adding in race ethnicity. And so that's in the context of disparities and equity. And then um, AIM-2 is adding in the health-related mediators. And I just wanted to call out that when we're putting race ethnicity in the models this way, um, it is not um, a biologic marker. It is a social marker that patterns exposure to social determinants. And we'll use tech causal inference techniques like multiple mediation and moderation, which also can be thought of as um, effect modification and potential impact analysis or G computation, which allows us to, we build models and then we can think about if you, um, if you change the distribution of certain factors that are in your model, how would that impact um, the occurrence of SMM and disparities? And then um, finally, I'll give you a little bit more information about this AIM-3, which is the collaboration with the perinatal quality collaboratives. And basically the objective here is to evaluate the impact of varied um, collaboratives, which are um, named at the bottom of the slide, um, which represent actual changes in hospital quality of care versus sort of simulated through the models um, and how that impacts racial ethnic disparities in SMM. And then we want to integrate these findings into the broader causal pathway framework that I showed you, which will be developed in AIMS 1 and 2. And it will be, the, that sort of framework will be repl replicated in state-specific state analyses so that, that we can pair it with what's going on with QI collaboratives in each state. So our underlying hypothesis is that SMM is worse among minoritized women because they receive lower quality care. That's one aspect of it. And have greater physiologic vulnerability through embodiment of their lifelong experiences. And we hypothesize that improved care through the collaboratives in particular can reduce inequity and has greater impact. The standardized improved care has greater impact on the dorotized um, women and leads to reduced disparities. So that's the gist of it. And then how we're setting up the analyses, we will add in some extra data years for these particular states, such that, um, again, focusing on black white disparities as an example, because they tend to be the strongest. Um, we will have about 20,000 um, births to people who identify as black per year in each state. So it turns out to be approximately the same number per state, despite the fact that the birthing population or numbers are very different by state as well as the demographics. And that's the percent of um, births, the 517 to 37, the percent of births to um, black um, persons um, in each state. And then we'll use interrupted time series analysis to evaluate the QI impact. And then um, second step will be, like I said, apply that framework for AIMS 1 and 2 to each state. And then we'll be able to compare, ideally, potential impacts of social determinants with potential impacts of the collaboratives at a population level, as well as within subgroups. And then we can, that helps open um, a conversation to consider and prioritize um, what types of um, potential pre prevention strategies make sense in each state. And so that's um, sort of our, our call to, to action with this grant. And then I also wanted to say that um, I think it's really important to um, try to find ways to make this work, um, the California work, the expanded work, more community engaged. I know there's a lot of conversation about this right now and I'm learning myself. I have not done it in the past. Um, so some of the things were, but, but many of the people on my team certainly have. And um, so one thing we're proposing and trying to get funding for is to do some qualitative data collection to bring in the voice of people with the lived experience of SMM to think about um, um, really um, 
think more deeply about the personal experience, which in turn can form how we ask our epidemiologic questions as well as how we interpret them. And we would also like to form a community advisory board, at least to support the California work. Um, so that is, uh, we're trying to get funding for that and, and doing, doing what we need to do to get that started. And then also um, in this vein, I am on sabbatical. I'm actually in New Orleans for a few months and just wanted to show, um, shout out for the scholars and service program, which is supporting my time here. And um, it's really for me to kind of get out of my silo and really start to learn more about community engagement and engage with people who are really community providers as well as um, hospital providers and how that all sort of intersects here within this context. Because Louisiana in particular has like some of the, unfortunately the worst um, sort of report card on, um, on many um, health outcomes, including maternal health. And I also wanted to note that the Scholars in Service just announced its um, next round of applications for um, uh, requests for applications. So if anybody wants to talk to me about the experience and um, applying, please, please let me know. Um, and my partner here in Louisiana, I wanna thank her also is Veronica Gillespie, the head of the Louisiana PQC and also head of the Maternal Mortality Review Committee here. And then people within the, mater the Maternal Child Health Coalition, which is a whole where many of the people involved in maternal health um, um, come together and, and really try to organize and, and collaborate. So I will stop there. I appreciate you listening. And um, the couple of photos I've shown, I'll just um, um, thank my husband for those. And they are from New Orleans. So I will stop sharing so we can go back to seeing each other. And I guess we have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for this outstanding talk. I'm just going to go through the chat here first. Um, Ron Gibbs says, Susan, excellent presentation. Congrats on new grant. What will your measures be for quality of care? Um, well, there are some, it'll be hospital level. It's not, um, sorry, I'm just, my Zoom is acting a little funny. Um, so some hospital level quality metrics, um, like what's the NTSV rate? What is actually the SMM rate? Those things reflect that. Um, also hospital characteristics, you know, and I know that quality of care is much more than that, but we're doing what we can with available data. Um, and Elliot is a, collaborator on this, Elliot, I, you know, we're collaborating closely with him and CMQCC and you are the experts on that. Um, so we're also developing yeah, we, other potential measures that would go through a little bit more in the life course, such as, uh, you, you know, in our other project on anemia, we're looking at the proportion of women who have uh, hemoglobins under 11 at the time of hospital admission as a outpatient measure. Uh, that correlates, and so there's others that are in the works that we're, you know, that's the value of having big data sets is that we can start exploring other ways of measuring quality rather than the, the national uh, indicators that Susan mentioned, mentioned. And I guess that that sort of thing is something we might not necessarily get through, um, you know, the kind of data that I've been talking about, but I guess in collaboration with, I mean, that's the kind of thing CMQCC can do through its um, network and then, you know, bring the pieces together, hopefully. Yeah, Susan, I, Elliot, I, I guess my concern is that um, SMM rate and cesarean delivery rate, those are all multifactorial mm -hmm. and quality of care does enter into it, but there are also uh, comorbidities associated with the patient population. Elliot just mentioned uh, hemoglobin at the time of admission. Well, that could reflect quality of care. It could also reflect... Uh, adherence. It could also affect uh, late prenatal care. So, um, I, boy, it's, it's just a tricky thing to come down to really find specific, totally uh, in measures of care, quality of care. Agreed. And yeah, it's a complex, you know, I've just like thrown out a whole bunch of stuff here, but hopefully, you know, um, we can do um, some work including quality of care. And I think that where what you're bringing up, Ron, I'd love to hear your ideas too. We could brainstorm. And I just think it's really important 
speaks to how important it is how we frame this and frame it carefully um, and frame it, make sure that the limitations are clear and not misconstrued. Yeah. So when you do quality collaboratives, you can measure more direct ones, such as you know, timely treatment of severe hypertension, which is one we widely use for the hypertension project. Uh, that is fairly intensive to collect, however. Uh, you know, there, there's, you could always quibble about uh, some of those, but that's a pretty pure one. Uh, and I think we're, we're looking for more and more of those that we can get. But each of those has a data collection burden. Yeah. And that's why, too, but, to, you know, it's like important to toggle between, you know, there's some of this broad work that can be done and then the more specific work, um, you know, smaller, more confined, um, you know, data collection effort or because mm -hmm. all the pieces are important. You know, and, that, and that's, I think, the value of AIM-3, which is look, working with some of the quality collaboratives uh, that have more of the granular data than, than what you will get in the administrative, big administrative data sets. Well, thank you. Uh, we are out of time. Um, and so, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Susan, for outstanding talk and some great questions. Um, and we will all get together uh, for the next talk. And I think it, we're planning on that being a couple of the oral presentations um, from SMFM uh, being presented here. So until then, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.